Hello everyone, good evening. You're watching News Epicenter with me, Maria Shakil. The second wave continues to wreak havoc across the country as reports are continuing to come of shortage of beds, of oxygen supply, of multiple medicines as well. And clearly the health infrastructure is overstretched. As India recorded over 3,50,000 cases in the last 24 hours with over 28,000 deaths, the highest single day spike and death toll. The center has put in place multiple measures to ramp up the health infrastructure and streamline the supply of oxygen to critical patients across the country. But the problem persists at critical care centers across the country. This comes as we are just four days away from the third phase of the mass inoculation program, which kicks off on the 1st of May. It will test the digital infrastructure of the nation where the center says vaccination for all between 18 and 44 will be held through appointments via the COVID app. It also comes in the midst of a political war of words between the center and the opposition over differential pricing. After the Serum Institute and Bharat Biotech announced their rate cards offering states the vaccines at 400 and 600 per dose, while the center, as per the previous contracts, gets the jabs at 150 per dose. Calls are also come in, coming in for the center to invoke the competitive licensing clause of the 1970 Patent Act to control vaccine price and increase production by expanding the ambit of vaccine licenses. The problem persists at multiple levels across the country. Let's look at solutions moving away from politics in the second wave. Joining me now on the show, Dr. Anupam Sibyl. He is the Group Medical Director, Apollo Hospitals. We are also being joined by Dr. Sunil Kumar. He is Director General of Health Services. Dr. Vivek Rajoria, he is the MD Medicine National Hospital in Bhopal. And we'll also be joined by relatives of those who are suffering and those who have recovered as well. Dr. Anupam Sibyl, I'm coming to you first. Look at what really happened just months ago, which made epidemiologists and top medical experts in the country almost predict that the worst is over. What's causing this unprecedented surge in the second wave? Uh, hi, Maria. Um, delighted to be uh, with you again. Uh, so a few things. I think firstly, what we've had is that, you know, the COVID avoidance behavior fatigue syndrome. So people, 13 months, it's gone on, numbers had come down. I remember on your show, when we looked at numbers coming down to like 4,000, 8,000 um, in Feb. So people said, well, you know, we seem to have emerged yes. victorious. So let's stop worrying about everything that the docs have been telling us for the last 13 months. Let's remove the masks and try and create bubbles. And the bubble, of course, would consist of 10 people or 12 people where people would meet and nobody had any idea of who they were meeting uh, when they were outside the bubble. Uh, people stopped uh, worrying about this. And I think it's it just been the guard went down. And the other thing that happened is that once vaccination started and, and you know, this has been reported worldwide, once you get a shot of the vaccine, you feel, yeah, you know, I've got a shot and I'm going to be protected. And then the guard goes down. And uh, I think these reasons have resulted in an I'm, overall scenario, if you look at besides and of course, those, what's happened in Maharashtra yes. also. Yeah. Is, is definitely something yes, that besides the numbers that you're talking wave, about, besides the fatigue, I, just look at just look at this, uh, the SARS CoV 2 antibodies being found in people as well. There were studies that were conducted which had suggested that the let me give you an example uh, National Institute of Epidemiology in Chennai, all of them had conducted these studies, and the studies had suggested that nationally some 271 million people had been in infected already, which is about one-fifth of India's population of 1.4 billion. So the level of infection was also, you know, counted in terms of the zero surveys, which had suggested that people had been in infected already. So besides fatigue, there was this data which was making the epidemiologists perhaps more cautious and careful. Uh, almost predicting that the worst is over. But Dr. Sibyl, talking specifically about what is happening in the national capital, um, the Apollo group of hospitals had sent an SOS to the center, to the Delhi government as well. How is the situation right now, vis-a-vis -vis the oxygen scenario? 
Well, I think the oxygen situation has become better, and and we are really grateful to to all the governments, to uh, you know the the Home Ministry, to the Delhi government, to the central government, to the providers, to the transporters, to everyone. It has eased a bit, but. Uh, you know, we we just want to have enough supply so that we don't have to worry about it, uh, because most hospitals can store only for two or three days. This is highly uh, combustible, as you know. So two or three days is what uh, is the provision that most hospitals have. So if we have enough for 24, 36 hours, we can breathe easy. But my, I want to make a couple of points, and, and through the you know through your show. That, you know, just about half an hour ago, I got someone calling me. I want remdesivir. I'm sitting at home. Please provide remdesivir. Um, there are people with an oxygen saturation of 94 panicking, wanting to get into an ICU. There are those with mild fever who've been vaccinated twice and saying, hey, listen, can I get into the ICU? So let's just demystify this for a minute. You only need remdesivir yes. if you are in hospital, you're oxygen dependent. You don't need it at home. It's not to be prescribed at home. So please don't go around getting really hyper about get me remdesivir. If your saturation is 92, 93, you're okay. But if the saturation is dropping consistently, 95, 92, 90, 89, and you are on oxygen and things aren't getting better, you need to get into hospital. But that's the scenario, not because it went down from 96 to 95. So we are having a whole lot of panic here, and that's really pushing the system as well. And then there are people who... who who get okay and can go home and then say, no, 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 I need to be in hospital for two more days. So, you know, we, ha we are having some of this and I think the narrative needs to change. We need to give out very clear messaging on who needs to be in hospital, yes. who needs to be on medication, who needs to be on oxygen, who needs to be in ICU. It's not about I will feel comfortable. It's about whether you need it or not. And the person who needs it most should get preference over someone who just wants the physical or the emotional comfort. Absolutely. Yes. So breaking myths. Let's break some more myths about this entire second wave. Uh, Dr. Sunil Kumar, Director General of Health Services, is also joining us. Dr. Kumar, um, there are these concerns being raised also of some people showing symptoms, but RT-PCR tests are getting delayed because the entire health infrastructure is so overburdened. So tests, tests get delayed, reports get further delayed, and then the anxiety level only shots up. Yes, uh, there may be some uh, concerns. Uh, am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Yes, loud and uh, clear. Yes, okay. So, yes, your question is right and your concern is also right. We do have uh, a little bit of problem as far as the reporting is concerned. But I tell you, this is uh, uh, one we have to take a precaution that once we have a uh, uh, little bit of symptoms like that, even if the, uh, the symptoms are mild, and we have already subjected ourselves to, uh, we presented ourselves to the lab, saying that, uh, please uh, get my test done. And then it's a question of just waiting. And I tell you, not more than 24 hours are, uh, uh, are there generally. Uh, we do get the report within 24 hours, and sometime earlier than that. And uh, the public has to take a precaution that during that time also they should think that they may be positive and therefore take all the precautions rather than becoming careless, rather than becoming casual and go around and uh, maybe spread the infection because there are chances that they may be positive and there are very little chances that may be negative. So therefore, they should err on the on the side of the being positive and presume that while the test when the test comes positive, they are definitely uh, infected. If they if they test negative, even that does not rule out the infection. So it's better to take precaution than repent later. Okay, I'm going to come back to both Dr. Sibyl and Dr. Kumar in just a bit. Let's, let's uh, shift focus now to small towns of India. I'm going to Bhopal now with Dr. Rajoria. Dr. Rajoria, help us understand what exactly is the situation right now in Bhopal in vis-a-vis -vis the health infrastructure and are there beds available for the patients? Um, uh, what about the oxygen uh, overall availability in the hospitals there? Hello, am I audible? Hello. Yes. Can yes. you hear me, ma'am? We can hear you. 
Yeah. Okay, and thanks a lot yes. for joining. We can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Uh, situation, situation here in Bhopal is also uh, there is lots of us uh, rush in the hospital. Beds are getting occupied very fast, and uh, oxygen scenario after intervention from the government it's getting better now. Each and every hospital is getting now oxygen, but uh, the daily occupancy is uh, I mean all the beds are full and people are coming uh, in critical situation in ambulances and we are trying to get them bed everywhere possible. So it, it's it's very hard to keep all the patients in the hospital. Some some people we are treating in the OPDs and we are giving injections in the OPDs, supportive treatment, whatever we can do in the hospital and in the OPD basis, helping them emotionally, physically, and each and everything we are trying. Uh, healthcare infrastructure is almost full in the Bhopal. And and medicines are available. Do you have enough medicines medicine? Are, me uh, oxygen supply. ICU beds. And medicines are after intervention from the government we are getting medicines and oxygen also but the thing here is ma'am that the number of the, the number of patients are more so we need more beds more uh, supporting staff rather than rushing for the medicines ma'am right now from all the periphery patients are coming in sick condition we need beds for those patients also ma'am so rather than rushing for the medicines we should get beds and supporting staff so that we can accommodate all these numbers of the patients. I think that uh, should be the crux here. Yes, Dr. Rajoria, there have been several instances also of uh, several hospitals and clinics where uh, the frontliners, that is the doctors, the nurses, the ward boys have tested positive. What is the situation right yeah. now in your hospital? Uh, Ma'am, we are keeping all the precautions, whatever we can. There are a number of instances where healthcare workers are coming positive, but the number is very much less. So we are keeping our finger crossed, try to do uh, whatever we. Okay, okay. Uh, Sohit uh, Chaudhary um, is is joining us from Patna. He had faced lots of crises from admission in a hospital to medicines, but the good news is that his family members have recovered. Sohit, tell us what really happened. Uh, yes, hi, good evening. Uh, we, my uh, in-laws were initially in a private uh, hospital where the there was a crisis of a depletion in oxygen. They were not getting their own supplies. There was also issue of uh, not all medicines being available there. Uh, thereafter, they were transferred to Ames Patna, uh, which was which was a task. But we were but after having. Uh, being transferred to Ames Patna, the, of course, the treatment which was given was fantastic. It was particularly on point, and uh, absolutely, therefore, the doctors are very experienced pertaining to COVID. But there is an issue, you know, when the when the doctor, the, there is one advisory which says remdesivir cannot should not be purchased by individuals and should not be cannot be administered administered out of an hospital area. But at the same time, doctors are uh, prescribing remdesivir. So you know this that advisory rather than to be it to be to us it should be to the hospitals and doctors if in case the medicine is not required let it not be prescribed because otherwise people are uh, go, running from pillar to post and uh, you know that that is leading to black marketing of the medicine as well. Hmm, that is true. But uh, the recovery was fast in your case and uh, there were no complications. Although you faced complication before the admission into a hospital, right? Yes. So my in-laws were tested positive on 10th of April and as of this afternoon, they've been discharged and they're back home. Okay. So that's good news. Uh, Dr. Sibyl, yes. uh, recovery rates uh, is also improving in the country. But Dr. Sibyl, the point being made by Sohit is valid. You know, uh, if the doctors, if, if there is this entire myth around remdesivir being seen as this wonder drug supposed to solve all the issues, supposed to, you know, you know, attack the virus, then why is it that uh, it's, it shouldn't it be, uh, uh, you know, administered in a very hospital-like condition rather than what is happening right now, which is rampant black marketing of uh, uh, remdesivir? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, it's not just about remdesivir not at home. It's also remdesivir in the hospitalized patients in very selected situations. Uh, it's like steroids have a clear role. Oxygen has a role. Uh, remdesivir has a role. And other medication 
has a role in a very small proportion of patients. Plasma might have a role in selected cases. So, you know, all this has become a part of a protocol, you know. Our protocol at Apollo, we've revised 37 times. The AIMS protocol just came out. Government of India has a protocol. So I think management for COVID has to be based on a protocol, which is based on evidence. And believe you me, never has a condition been studied as much as COVID. The number of publications, we get 11 or 12 papers an hour, every 24 hours that are published. So there's a lot of evidence out there, and we really need to stick with evidence-based medicine. So there, there are no two ways about it. Treatment needs to be strictly according to protocol. Of course, in certain situations, the protocol might need to be tweaked, but by and large, that's a guiding, um, you know, guiding light, and that's what we need to adhere to. And uh, and if we do that, the vast majority of patients do very well. Let me also add here, and and and, and we must have some bit of positivity while we talk about, you know, the challenges that each one of us is facing, whether it's healthcare providers or patients or the community at large is that the vast majority of individuals do very well. Those who vaccinated have a very mild course. They have a little bit of fever, mild symptoms. They don't need hospitalization. If they need hospitalization, which is rare, they don't get into the ICU. They don't have serious complications. And COVID is not fatal. So, you know, let's look at these positive bits as well. Hmm. Okay, we will. Uh, Dr. Sunil Kumar, uh, there were reports coming in from several parts of India, although Bombay, for example, yesterday only Mumbai said that uh, the BMC went on to announce their uh, oxygen issues have been sorted out. Um, how confident are you that uh, with all the measures that have been undertaken, particularly in the last one week, uh, will ensure the entire uh, streamlining, if I may use that word, of uh, the ex uh, oxygen movement? Because India, of course, is the biggest uh, producer of oxygen. It was more about uh, transportation and not as much about absence of uh, oxygen. I must, uh, through, through your channel, uh, say, uh, because it is washed over the uh, entire nation, that we have unnecessarily a panicking situation. We need to stop panicking. That's number one. There is a situation as far as the oxygen is concerned is not only gradually, but fast improving and improving significantly. Uh, Dr. Chaudhary has just mentioned that we have to be careful about remdesivir. And it has been stated very, very clearly that remdesivir is not but, a but round but one, is not the medical drug. Uh, the sense is... The sense is the Niti Aayog data is also suggesting that the peak is still very far. I had a principal scientific advisor to the Prime Minister, Professor Raghavan, on my show last week, and he had clearly suggested that the peak is likely towards the month end or perhaps in mid-May. If that is the time that we are looking at with cases rising steadily and exponentially at 3.5 lakh per day, then perhaps the requirement of the oxygen will also be more. Will you be able to meet that kind of requirement which the country will witness perhaps in the month of May, mid-May? Well, one of the advantages of uh, predicting or uh, using mathematics to, to predict the signs or the, or the future of the disease is that we need to get prepared. We need to be, we use the data rationally so that we prepare ourselves and therefore that same thing will apply for not only the oxygen, it will apply to the beds, it will apply to the other resources. But the thing is that this is completely preventable, this is completely stoppable if we behave properly, if we follow the, the anti-COVID behavior, if we COVID appropriate behavior, if we, if we tend to adopt that as a routine, do not become lax, do not become complacent about it, and stop complaining about it rather than that, we cooperate with the, with the government. We do not panic. We do not hoard. We do not uh, black market. We do not create a, a, a bad situation where uh, we become self-centered and uh, the, the important treatment or the vital treatment is denied to the, to the needy people. It's a clearly a demand and a need. You know, demand cannot be the right way of, cannot justify the use of anything. It is a need based. And the only a few percent of the patients genuinely need these things, the oxygen, the hospitalization, the other drugs. 
the rems uh, remdesivir and other other very very few very very okay. few patients will actually need it and therefore we need to take a ac- uh, into account that okay peak may be coming fine but that is not necessarily true last year also there were there were uh, you know uh, predictions and which never came true so it's not that the all the predictions will come true okay. even if even if it does come okay. we need to prepare ourselves right now so that we are geared up the government is already geared up we are already preparing okay, ourselves okay dr rajoria okay thank you okay i'll give the final words to dr anupam sibal but before that dr rajoria quick word from you dr rajoria point being made here of how prepared is the health infrastructure uh, particularly coming to your hospital in bhopal given the kind of cases yeah. that you saw is the case is only increasing the patient admission only increasing uh, or has it declined temporarily uh, because of uh, almost like a nightmarish scenario which played out say a week ago is are things looking uh, more in control and slightly numbers are coming uh, less nowadays uh, but uh, the cri- number of critical patients which were coming last week they, those numbers are same but the other patients uh, they are uh, their number are definitely less in this week but the number of critical patient these are same okay. so i think it will take some time to uh, subside ma'am okay yeah. okay let me give the final words to dr anupam sibal dr anupam sibal you heard about remdesivir concerns um if remdesivir is no, is part of a protocol only for serious patients uh, then what will you be telling all hospitals where admissions are happening just for because some patients feel anxious they may be showing some signs of deterioration what exactly are these signs which require hospitalization that's a very important point uh, hospitalization is indicated if your oxygen levels are dropping like i said your saturation not going from 96 to 95 but consistently dropping if you're actually getting really breathless if the the fever after day 5 day 6 is very high if you are looking at an individual who has comorbidities uh, who's otherwise suffering from a lot of medical conditions and is not getting better um someone who's basically a uh, feeling really miserable the consultation uh, the consultation with uh, the the video consultation that usually happens with uh, the the physician or the chest specialist and the and the and the biomarkers uh, are are suggestive of deterioration the inflammatory markers are high these are indications when you have to go in and these consultations uh, are the ones that are going to decide who goes in and who doesn't it's not based on what you read from on whatsapp and it's not based on what your your friends advise you please leave it to the experts we do have fair amount of expertise in managing this if i just speak on behalf of apollo hospitals we've treated 140000 patients with covid so let's leave it to the experts to decide who gets in and who gets what how prepared are you and the entire i mean i would say how prepared is the entire apollo group uh, particularly with the predictions coming that the surge is likely or the peak is likely somewhere mid may Uh, we are spending time every day looking at capacity building we saw that in delhi we built capacity we added beds we created an uh, you know a temporary facility we are looking at upskilling staff we are looking at staffing ratios to make sure those who don't have that much experience in uh, you know covid from other specialties coming on uh, we are preparing other hospitals and we we did that with uh, bangalore where we are now seeing numbers go up in the last 24 hours we are preparing all our hospitals we have hospitals in 16 states the numbers are going up pan india and we are preparing all hospitals based on the learning that we had from nasik mumbai and delhi and taking it across uh, seamlessly so that we are better prepared and build capacity so i think it's all about building capacity it's about getting the infrastructure right it's about having the reserves very importantly having the teams well prepared and having the morale up you know it it is very so, important in that one one thought that is that comes to my mind a question that is repeatedly asked is why didn't the governments prepare or scale up the infrastructure do the capacity augmentation in the last 8 months because it is about learning lessons from the world it's about learning lessons also from the spanish flu where the second second wave of war was far more virulent infectious and deadly 
Right. I, you know, I mean, I can't comment. I can only comment about uh, where I work and I can only comment about our system. I think everybody has been trying to do whatever they can with whatever facilities, access that they have to do whatever they can. Uh, and I think we, we have a situation where the numbers have increased much more than anyone had, had anticipated. And I think as numbers mount and they mount in different parts of the country, we just need to learn from each other. And I think they should be cross-learning. That is very, very important. All right, Dr. Anupam Sibal, always a pleasure to have you on my shows. Uh, Dr. Sunil Kumar, Dr. Vivek Rajoria, Shohit Chaudhary, thanks Thank for you. sharing your experience there. That's all from me. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll be joining you in just a bit.